For continuous air and water barriers on your next build, choose Zip System Sealing Solutions. Seal tough jobs in a flash. Hello, Unbuilded Podcast. Steve Basic here, Jake Bruton, Peter Yost. Hello. Hello. We're here for another fun day at the Unbuilded Podcast studio. Today, hopefully you're excited, because I am, we're going to talk about... I can tell from your voice. <laughs> That's what I have to deal with. Today, we're going to talk about Builder or manager? And, and basically the trades. You know, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of chatter out there, shortness of trades, um, which I probably agree with. I, I don't think there's probably enough uh, talent in that talent pool. But one of the questions that I've always had is, in, in, in dealing with high-performance homes, you know, when, when I started out, say, 30 years ago, believe it or not, I actually worked for a carpenter for a while. And the carpenter there, the guy that owned the company, had a tool belt on every day. And he would meet the um, trucks when they make deliveries, take his belt off, handle the delivery, and then put his belt back on. But we also did all of the framing. We did the finish work and trim work in the project. So... You know, the, the guy in charge, Mike, had a really good handle on what was going on. and He was very he, present. Very present and pretty much totally in control because everything went through his ears, eyes, and hands. Um, but today, it seems, you know, when I'm dealing with projects, that things are a lot different. You know, I'll, I'll meet with a company owner and he'll sell the project. And when they get awarded the project, chances are I get attached to a project manager. Yep. But the project manager isn't really out at the job site doing the work. You know, we have a site guy, site super, that's in charge of the project out there. And, you know, some of them do some work, some don't. They're more of managers. And then they turn around and manage a whole series of subs. That would include framers and trim carpenters and specialty guys. I mean, trim carpenters these days even get broken down to, you know, stair guys and the people that do windows and yeah, baseboard or just do and cabinets. doors or just do cabinets. Um, so, you know, the, there, there's the opportunity there for a huge disconnect, right? That if I have a detail or a concern about a project, well... I tell the project manager, he tells the site super, site super tells the framer, the framer tells the guy that's actually going to do the work. And it reminds me of that little, you know, school game in kindergarten where telephone. you telephone where you whisper a, an idea or a sentence into someone's ear and then we all laugh because by the time it comes out five people later, it's a totally different story. And you got that one jerk kid that does whatever he wants. And yeah, you got the one jerk kid. Which is that, the same as the job but, site. But it's, it's that idea that, you know, years ago with my buddy Mike, someone gave him or had that conversation with him and it went right to the person that was going to be dealing with it or overseeing it. Now it goes through a series of, of hands. And I'm just questioning, is that better, worse? Does it matter? How do, we, how do we deal with that? Well, let's start with the potential positives then. If I have a guy on site that all he does is install cabinets, chances are he's really freaking good at installing cabinets. If that's all he does every day, his tool setup is tuned specifically to that, his skill level is tuned specifically to that, and he's seen every possible problem that can go wrong with installing cabinets, and chances are he has a method for dealing with it before it becomes a problem. I would agree with that. But what when you're when you're trying to introduce a new air sealing detail, yep, that nobody has seen. So the cabinet guy, I agree with, but that's a pretty easy one to justify. That's why I picked it. Exactly, right. The harder one to justify is, or or even better yet, say we're trying to do something with the HVAC contractor, right? 
that by the time it gets all the way down to the guy that's doing it, you know, is he getting the same amount of information that I gave to the project manager? Yeah, he's not. Yeah. It's and you have guys show up on site that don't even look at the plans. Somewhere it's getting filtered down through there. And then when it comes back up, the, the other problem is, is you then you go to the job site and you say, hey, you know, this is in the wrong place or this wasn't done right. Now you have to spend all that time going all the way up the chain of command to try and find out where the loose lips were that changed the idea. And, and then we have to sort it out and go back down the chain of command and try again. Right. So it just seems like it takes a lot of time. And it's, it's, it's just one of those things. I mean, there's, there's people out there that say, oh, we're losing our craft. Right. And, and, you know, which is maybe, I, maybe not. And I don't think we're losing our craft. I think a lot of people are forfeiting the craft in favor of other things. What right? do you mean? Well, I'm saying that you, you have the opportunity to do as much as you want if you're the owner of the company. But if you choose to be more of a manager and less of a worker, then I think you're forfeiting. Do we lose something? Right. And I mean, that's a choice you're making, right? So that's a, but that's a yes and a no, right? Like if I have 10 houses going at once and I have 10 project managers and I, as a really good, high quality business owner, have hired people that are better than me to project manage, then potentially those guys are on site enough that these, these disconnects don't happen. The problems don't happen. Their knowledge base is better than mine. Like there comes a point where, well, that's, I mean, that's my transition in my company, right? I grew up in a business where my dad was the guy that you're talking about. When delivery showed up, he was there helping us unload. And when the truck went away, we all put our tools back on and we went back to work. And my entire life growing up in the business, my dad was on the job site every day. We ran one job at a time for the most part so that he could just be on that job every day. When I took over the firm, the same thing happened. For the first five years of me owning the business, I was on site every day and doing estimates in the morning or in the evening after my kids went to bed and doing the books after my kids went to bed. And I truly was like, okay, I can't take the company any further just on my shoulders. We have to figure this out. We have to expand. We have to become something different. Yeah. And exactly what you're talking about happened. I hired 15 people. We were running a 6,000 square foot addition and a 1,800 square foot addition and two bathrooms at once. And none of them were being well taken care of because we weren't paying close enough attention. And I had good site guys, but they weren't incredible. Right. right. And it took me a while to notice that. And now we've reverted back to... I do wear my tool bags maybe one or two days a month, but I'm on the site every day with my guys, with my crew. I mean, it's, it's probably it's very true of architecture offices, too, that at some point, if you choose to get big enough, then you forfeit doing some of that design work or some of the detailing work in lieu of trying to manage the 12 projects you have in the office. Um, instead of the two projects that you would have had when you were doing that work. Um, and I'm not saying one is, is worse or one is a better. It's just, I don't know. I, how do we consider this? How, yeah, how do we consider this? And, you know, part of it is, is I just did a large project and I kind of circumvented the, the owner and project manager and just dealt with the site super most of the time. But that's a relationship that you've built over a few projects, right? Yeah. And and he was a really, you know, it was really good because we, then we could get stuff done quickly. We, he, he could get answers to questions very quickly. And I was assured that what I was asking for was getting done. But then you're basically talking about your and I's relationship, though, too. While I'm not on every job all day, I am on every job every day. And it's I'm close enough tied in, right? So there's yeah. this happy medium Potentially. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, you know, there, as we progress too, like I see other people, um, I just recently met a builder in uh, the, the Southwest and it's like, he almost became, was like graduated as a businessman and figured, yeah, you know what, I'll get into this building thing. 
and he has pretty much no knowledge of building. He understands how to run a company. That that's pretty evident. But you know, it's it's one of those things where building has only gotten more complicated in the last twenty years, and it seems like we're not appreciating that complication. Yeah, society views what we do as a bunch of rednecks on site smoking cigarettes and nailing boards together, wherein it's Peter way more that way, it's that way. way more complicated than manufacturing widgets or, you know, making soda pop. It's it's way more complicated than lots of things that we do right. when you look at the nuts and bolts of it and we don't treat it like that for some reason. Right. Well this makes me think of hey, the Hey Peter is here. <laughs> This makes me think of the program that actually you and I worked on together for Ibicus in the Building America program called the Scopes of Work. And the idea was if we've got all this specialization and we need to connect their work, how do we do that? And one of the ways is to have scopes of work for each of the trade contractors that are connected. That's what we do. And NEHB had a program, mm -hmm. it was Lindsay Davenport who wrote it. She worked. She was quality control for a production builder out of Atlanta, and she wrote a book called The Scopes of Work. And the key elements of her uh, program were that every sequential trade contractor had to have a checklist to go into their work and to exit their work. And every subsequent trade had to sign off at the beginning of their work that the previous one had completed their work and you know it was it was a really interesting quality control program. And in the beginning of the book, she said, "You either do this program, or you don't. There's no halfway. You have to commit to the process." And the second thing is, you're going to have to fire at least one project manager and at least one trade contractor as part of this process because they're going to resist. So what does it have to do with Building America? What we did was Building America said, "Take that scopes of work program and make it high performance." So what did we do? we went in and connected all the building enclosure and mechanical system contractors, and you actually worked and developed mm -hmm. details for this, um, and we made all of the sign-offs performance tests. That's what was lacking from the Davenport program. And interestingly, um, I actually wrote to her to get permission to use her program, and she responded saying, well, you bought the book, right? And I said, yeah. And the Scopes of Work book is this, you know, paper-backed, but in the back, in a sleeve, there's a CD with all of the Scopes of Work. And she said, well, if you bought the book and it has the CD with it, you, of course, have the right you, to modify you have a license. it. You have a license to change it because that was a whole idea. I wanted people to customize their Scopes of Work, which was kind of cool. Yeah. And she didn't know anything about high-performance buildings or building science, but she said, I'm delighted to have you use my framework to incorporate that. So we, cool. we, we and I worked on that program and that is still available on the internet. I wrote a blog for Green Building Advisor and we put in all the scopes of work that Steve and I had created into that. I guess, I mean, that certainly helps solve the problem, but it doesn't change the fact that this guy is a guy that went to business school and came out and said, okay, I'm gonna choose building as my business to manage. Yeah. And if I try to have a conversation with him about flashing, it's not a conversation, it's an education. Yeah, yeah. So you're, what you're saying is, uh, the derogatory term is the keyboard contractor, hmm. you know, the contractor that sits in the office and doesn't understand what's happening on the site. Yeah, I'm just saying it's like, if, if I can't have a legitimate conversation with the owner of the company, then what kind of conversation happens better, on the other side of him? There better dang well be somebody beneath him That's that what has I was the say. power he, to control he had, quality. If he's a good business person and he wants to get into high performance, he's got to be smart enough to know, hey, I, I shouldn't be talking to Steve. I should have somebody. Well, in this particular case, he's going to sub everything. He's like a one-man show that is going to sub pretty much everything out. So that's, it's like, that is a challenge how does because he, he's the quality control. Right. And then he's going to look at me and say, well, you know, you, you're going to have to help us out with the framers and stuff. And it's like, well, it's not my job to educate yeah. your subs, even though I, I can provide some of that help. But it's like there's, there's a, a disconnect, discontinuity yeah. or yeah. something there that – it makes it a challenge right from the start, as opposed to the other project that I just spoke of, where I'm talking to a site super who's one of the most intelligent builders I've ever met. Yeah, and easy. 
<laughs> so he's allowed to take things personally because occasionally you do too. So. No, I never take anything personally. And occasionally he's insulting. I'm never insulting. Also, so my eyebrows are. This my, is a. <laughs> my wife the other day drew her eyebrows on very high. <laughs> Just because she didn't, she knew she was going to be astonished by you anyway. I'm right? kidding. Uh, so this is the reason that I have not adopted the term general contractor, even though that's technically what I am. I still like the term mm. builder. Interesting. And it's just a nomenclature thing. It doesn't really impact anybody else's opinion of me. Probably, they probably <coughs> don't. Probably don't care one way or the other whether or not I call myself a builder or a general contractor. But I like to think that I still build things. I don't just general contract everything. Mm -hmm. And so builder for me makes me sleep better, I guess. I mean, we do have the opposite problem that people who go into the building industry, they like to build stuff. And so when they get, when they get into a situation, this happened all the time when I was building in uh, Seacoast, New Hampshire, that there would be these guys or gals that realized I can't make enough money off my own labor <coughs> as I get older. I'm going to have to change from a builder into a business person. Yep. Right. So the opposite is true. We have people. And that, that recognition are, comes late. Well, too. and and they're great builders, but they have no idea how to run a business. Yeah. So I have a, a friend that's a builder not too far from here, and we have conversations that there's two of them that own the business, and they have a couple employees, and like I'll talk to him on a weekly basis, and he's like, oh, I'm finishing up this thing that uh, that my guys got wrong yesterday. I'm like, Why are you doing it? And he's like, Well, I need to make sure that it's done correctly. Okay, first of all, they should have done it correctly. And if they didn't, why aren't they there? Well, it's just faster for me to go ahead and get it taken care of. Okay, but they didn't learn anything for next time, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, is your time really best spent fixing labor mistakes? Mm -hmm. Or is your time better spent managing people that are fixing that and managing the business and working on growing the business? And, you know, and he's uh, substantially older than me. And we talk about like, yeah, I don't make a living off of my back anymore. Yep. And he still really enjoys the idea that he makes a living off of his back, but he openly acknowledges that there's a clock. Yeah. So Steve, you said that this really good business person who happens to be a builder, um, that, that you're going to work with him to make sure that his trades get it right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how we do that, but he's he's going to so operate. You charge for it. That's as how. a general, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but he's going to work as a general contractor. So when he hires the framer, he doesn't have the education. Well, I'm just surprised to, to given the that framer, the best use of your time is as an architect, not as a building coach, right? Yeah, so. I mean, I, the, you know, I, part of it is is trying to get the the plans and. The design to a point where we're doing things that are common enough to that framer that that conversation is short, sweet, and and it works. But it, I, I just used him as an example yeah. that yeah. there's this huge disconnect that there's people in the industry now that have taken over. And I mean, I, I, a couple of years ago, I worked on a project with um, the the homeowner GC that which was a catastrophe. It's another topic. Yeah, that's a whole just other topic. Don't do it. <laughs> but they they hired a Just framer. No. They hired they hired a framer that the lumber yard suggested. Well, the framer framing company consisted of one guy in his Escalade that drove around and managed three different crews. Oh boy, right. And the three I different kind of want an Escalade. And the three different crews, the the crew that we had on the house, they didn't even speak English. They had one guy that was acting as interpreter, but he was there like half the time. And if I didn't catch the guy in the Escalade, then I had to rely on the interpreter. If I didn't do that, there was a whole lot of hand waving. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. And I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm just picturing Steve trying to get over a language barrier and like screaming, like, <laughs> no, here. <laughs> oh yeah. Here. We put it here. <laughs> and no, but, the end, though. they had like eight studs in this wall. And I think they were at eight different lengths. Ooh. Honestly, and it had a big bow on the top, and I was just trying to show them. Like I had to go in their trailer, get out a level, and yes, it was it was exactly like Jake said. It was pretty much a catastrophe. But what I do remember is the guy getting a step ladder and a full uh, sized sledgehammer, 
and like hammering the Beat. one that was high. It just like so not fun. taking it out and cutting it, but just hammering it down and then smiling and saying, okay. Hold up, framers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's all fixed. But we can we can really quickly say the like if you're gonna try to contract something for yourself. Number one, chances are you don't have the knowledge. Don't be insulting to my profession and say, well, you know, I've done a lot of this when I was growing up with my dad or I worked two summers for a framer. So now I know what I now I know how to build a house. I've been at this 25 years and I learned something every single day. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's no way you have enough knowledge to do exactly what we do. You might be able to doggy paddle through it and it'd be okay at the end, but you're not going to do what we do. Second, anybody you're going to hire does not give a crap about your business because your one house is not going to float their year, but the 10 jobs that I'm going to send them will, and they'll sure as hell answer the phone and show up when I get upset, but they're not going to do that for you. Yeah. Those two things are alone are enough for you to go stop. Yeah, home GCs. Just stop. Is, yeah, I, I always... Um, if you're passionate, ask the builder them. how you can be involved in a productive way. So I, I have, a, so I have a, another GC horror story, homeowner GC, right? And the, the husband and wife were there. He's talking about how he's going to GC the meeting and or GC the project. And it was a substantial project. And I looked at him and said, Pete, I said, no offense to you, but today's meeting... You showed up an hour late. You rescheduled it three different times to get here. And this was just one meeting with me and your wife. How do you think you're going to manage 10 subcontractors out on this job with your job? Mm -hmm. And immediately the wife went into the, I told you so, like just (laughs) ranted on him. And Steve is right. I told you so. I told you. He still tried to do it. Right. For how long? He did it through the whole project. But we went through three framers, two electricians. I think the plumber was like the only contractor that started and actually finished. He's got a boat payment. The project. Yeah, he's got a boat payment. So <laughs> he's got something to worry about. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that was a horror show. Um, and he, the, the homeowner, he was just, he was not a good listener it's at a, all. It's a big pet peeve of mine, and it really pisses me off when people are like, oh, yeah, you know, if I had more time, I could do this myself. There's no other profession. Like, you wouldn't go to the vet and be like, you know, I know how to do this. I'm just letting you hear you do it because you have the right tools. I don't want to have to buy the yeah. tool. Like, how <laughs> insulting is well, that? And I for some reason, society's up. okay with it. I remember showing up at that job. After they, they were getting ready to put the siding on, and along the window sills of every window, they stopped the vertical furring strip and put a horizontal one in. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and so I asked the siding guy, gonna... I said, well, oh, he goes, oh, that's to hold the trim. <clears throat> of course. And I was like, okay, but we have this whole sloped sill that's supposed to drain into these cavities, and you just ran a dam across it, across all 65 windows. So what do we do now? We have to tear those out. And of course, the homeowner's like all frustrated. And it's like, Pete. It's not on the plans. In the plans, it shows that open. So, but to sort of bring this back around to the whole issue of people who are head of building companies that don't know enough about the trade or the craft, right? Or uh, let's say, I I don't think it's don't know enough about it, but haven't come up through the craft. Interesting. Okay. Right. Because I think those guys, and that, that's probably true of any business, right? I mean, if you're the owner of the grocery store and you started out as the bagger. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have a better you're knowledge have a of the inner understanding inner of a grocery store. Yep. So are we advocating for, I, I mean, we need training programs for high performance across the board, but maybe we need a one, need one that's designed for people who are great business people, but need to learn more about the building process. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of that, I can't imagine some of that inadequacy of education doesn't drive the cost of building that house up. Right. Because somewhere the general contractor has to put in some kind of money because he knows somewhere down the line, things ain't going to go right. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have to fix it, change it, He's going to do and, everything he can for that to not be his pocket. And not to be his pocket, but then that means that the pocket. framer is probably putting it in his scope of work or something. But somewhere we're paying for 
those inadequacies up front, right? The homeowners getting the price to build this house that has some of that money built into it too. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I always, I always, you know, I think about it a lot and you see a lot of guys driving around and they just comment about this and that. And it's like, I don't think you, you, Mr. Contractor would actually know how to cope a piece of uh, crown molding or install it properly. But likewise, I would probably venture to guess the guy that I do know that can cope that crown molding to look like one piece folded in the corner mm -hmm. probably doesn't know how to run a business to save his life. Yeah, that's the tension. Yeah. Right? So that's the challenge is that you have these two worlds that need to interact. Most of the time, they're headed up by two different people. Mm -hmm. And they're very rarely the same person. So. Yeah, and I wonder when we do, say, home building crossroads training, how many times we get people in the room that are the head of a building business, don't have much understanding of the building process. Are they lost by what we cover in, you know, the home building crossroads? I bet a lot they, of times they are. Yeah. Because I've think, sat in some of your guys' presentations. Are they, going back, are they going back to their office and saying, oh, yeah, all that stuff Peter and talked about, that's good marketing stuff for us. Ooh, and yeah. they're so they don't see it as an advantage to good building. Yeah. They see it as a marketing marketing opportunity to their business. And you know, I can see that happening very, very easily. It's funny because we know that, you know, from our work in the Building America program that in order to build high performance homes, you have to be able to sell high performance homes. So we did trainings for sales staff. Because it's a different ball game. Yeah, that's just a whole nother, like, realtors, how they ruin. We should do on how realtors ru ruin the building industry. How about how realtors ruin everything? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we struck a nerve Sorry, here. all you realtors out there. Yeah. Find another podcast to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Not welcome. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's Take not. a hard life How do you increase your numbers? Realtors. <laughs> but anyways... I, I don't think we're going to solve it, but I think we've made some uh, really good points and uh, maybe brought some things to light, at least in my opinion anyway. Yeah, it's not as easy as some people make it out to be. Let's try our best to have the right people involved so that there's a knowledge base for checks and balances. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So trust, trust but verify. With that, any parting comments, gentlemen? I like ketchup. Did you say condiments or compliments or comments? That wasn't even, so it wasn't funny. It was a total waste of my time. It totally sidetracked me. Did you forget what you were? Sometimes I think I'm supposed to be the adult supervision here, and I'm totally inadequate. The, no, just because you're, you're substantially older than the rest of us yeah, doesn't mean you have to age, be the adult. Age, Thank you. Age doesn't mean you're smarter or better. It just means you're older, much yeah. older. And that the amount That's of time you spend saying, stretching but... in a day is double. <laughs> I don't, I'm not even going to say it. Okay, send us home it. then. All righty. So, there you have it. There's our little talk about builder or manager. And uh, thanks for joining us on the Unbuilder podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Go tell, I know I said go tell two of your friends last time, but tell five of your friends now. And uh, tell them to hit that subscribe button. Go look for all the other um, opportunities to learn on the Unbuild It show. We put up a bunch of videos. We have some great stuff. Peter's got all his wing nut testing. Um, we're videoing and we're throwing it up there. It's uh, just unbelievably good. So go check those out. And uh, until next time, thanks for joining us. See ya. Have a good day.